Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Hebo, speaking from Manchester. I am a, a student member from uh, the VPH Student Committee, and I will be moderating this uh, webinar today on behalf of the uh, Student Committee. First of all, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, the Student Committee of the VPH Students Institute is organizing keynote web series regularly and promoting the uh, VPH among fellow students. We, as the student committee, are open and we welcome contributions from uh, our fellow PhD students. So if any of you have uh, uh, want to join us and have any questions, please feel free to, to contact us. Uh, feel free to contact Martina. And of course, if you uh, you can find more information on the uh, webpage website. And for the uh, keynote web series, for each keynote uh, will last for around one hour. And today uh, we have a talk for around 45 minutes of presentation and it will be followed by a quick question and answer session. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Blanca Rodriguez from Oxford to give a talk on computer models in bi biomedicine, what for? Her research interests mainly on the investigation of causes of modulators of variability in the response of the heart to disease and therapies. She's working very closely with experimentalists, clinicians and pharmacologists in academia, hospitals and industry. Her group is part of the British Heart Foundation Center of Research Excellence and currently funded by a number of funding bodies, including Wellcome Trust, the European Commission, British Heart Foundation, EPSRC, and the Royal Society. So let's welcome Blanca and her talk. Hi, I'm gonna share my video just a second. Hello to everyone. Uh, so hello everybody and welcome to the talk. I was thinking when Martina approached me, I was thinking um, about what, what is it that we don't hear very often about in terms of computer models in biomedicine and the VPH Institute. And what I think is really, really important in order to continue having funding for our type of research is to showcase what it is that we bring to biomedicine that cannot be achieved through other means and, and the history of it. So I gave myself a title that I think is very ambitious and I was trying to um, put together the a talk that could fulfill uh, the aims I, I um, wrote some time ago. So I hope this is gonna give you a, a snapshot of what I think computer models have brought to my area of biomedicine. And I hope to hear more talks about what computer models have brought to other areas of biomedicine. And because that's going to lay the foundations for uh, our future research. So uh, what, what I think are the biggest challenges in biomedicine are, um, are outlined here. And the first one is to explain phenotypes, um, individual observable traits, and how people react uh, individually to a particular disease and how to treat it. This is the main aim of most of the research I do anyway, and most of the research that is done in biomedicine, from basic to translational science, but it's aiming at understanding the human body and individual phenotypes. In doing so, we try to overcome challenges like linking scales from genotype to phenotype, understanding how structure and function function play together in health and disease. And increasingly, we are trying to understand population heterogeneity and, the, and, and population heterogeneity due to differences in gen type, but also environmental factors. And I will tell you at the end that I think that's the biggest challenge in biomedicine, understanding population heterogeneity due to environmental uh, factors, uh, factors that are external to cells, to organs, to human bodies. And we just don't have a way to even categorize them. 
So how to achieve those data in biomedical sciences by acquiring data and interpreting them and analyzing them. So we have a heterogeneous, a heterogeneous variety of modalities to achieve that through in vivo non-invasive recordings and imaging. And this is a really, really important aspect in biomedical research and clinical practice, in fact, uh, in vivo invasive recordings through catheters, for example, but also we acquire data ex vivo and in vitro. And, and it is important to remember that when we acquire data, we obtain one snapshot on the time of the recording, but our human bodies are a dynamical system that are changing all the time due to internal processes, but also external processes. And these data are multi-scale, so they go from genes to uh, whole bodies, and they also are heterogeneous in terms of what they, what they are showing, structure and function. So so this is also a big challenge in biomedical science, the amount and, and quality and variety of data that are being acquired. How do we analyze them? How do we analyze these data? Statistics are very well established in biomedical sciences and they are in every clinical study. So even, even clinical journals have now reviewers that are statisticians for this. Um, image and signal analysis are also necessary. There are no other ways to actually extract, extract biomarkers uh, and through analysis, quantitative analysis of images and signals. But also uh, modeling and simulation has been a very important part of this analyzing data. And I will show that, that through my talk. There are uh, increasingly, I can see, uh, studies using uh, innovative approaches close to artificial intelligence like machine learning or crowdsourcing indeed, uh, which is actually becoming um, implemented in biomedical sciences. And we, we will hear more of this in coming years and combinations of all these uh, strategies. The challenge is so big that we don't need to choose one approach. We need all of them. And I will talk today about modeling and simulation, obviously, uh, because that's my research and that's what uh, VPH Institute is, uh, is about. But it is important to remember that the other approaches are there and we need to make the most out of them. So I, I, I uh, did a quick search in PubMed using the terms computational model, mathematical model, computer simulations, and in silico, and a total of over 62,000 papers came out. You can see here how many papers uh, were published using those terms in each of these five years, uh, five year periods. And you can see a huge increase in the number of computational model, mathematical model, computer simulations, and in silico. You can see that it's becoming a trend to actually use this in, in, um, com in computational biomedicine. Now, I I also looked at how many of these papers were published in, in specific journals. And you can see here that only 124 uh, were published in Nature, um, 150 were published in Science, and more than a thousand were published, for example, in Journal, journal of Theoretical Biology. I'm not, I'm not uh, claiming I'm doing a thorough study on what has been published where, but I, I I think this tells us something about how much research is being done as mathematical biology and how much we are pushing the boundaries of computational biomedicine to actually have an impact in biomedicine. And that's ob obviously a huge challenge. So uh, throughout, throughout my talk, I will talk about what I think are two sides of the same coin. Computer models in biomedicine are representations and they, they aim to represent parts of biomedical systems. But I think we shouldn't lose sight that bio, computer models in biomedicine are tools that enable us to discover new things. And while these are two sides of the same coin, what I would argue is that the representational aspect of the models shouldn't constrain our ability to discover. In, in, in using, in focusing on one side of the coin or the other, I think we, we, we advance, we make the, uh, the field of computer models in biomedicine advance in different ways. And I will try to illustrate this now. 
So when computer models in biomedicine are considered representations and aim at representing an organ, what we, what we focus on is in their ability to integrate data from different scales. This slide obviously focuses on, on cardiac modeling, which is my area of expertise, and in particular, electrophysiology. And you can see here how the models have been developed by integrating data from the ionic currents to the whole organ. And in doing so, they have identified gaps of knowledge, they have developed new mathematical modeling and numerical techniques, they have developed computer science, and they have pushed the technical boundaries of what we can simulate. So looking at models as representations has led to incredible advances in what we can simulate. They have uh, provided a, an immense toolkit that we can use to simulate the electrical activity of the heart, fluid dynamics, and you can see here examples of recent outcomes of this work that has led to incredible technological developments. We are able to simulate a deforming human heart, and here's an example of this research. We are even able, uh, this is uh, work by Gernot Plagg, simulate a human whole heart electromechanics. And, and I think this work comes from the uh, focus on representing human activity rather than using uh, models as tools, which is something I will illustrate later. They lead to advancements in computational work, they are published in computational work, and they provide this toolkit for using models as tools in, in future years. But I would argue that the greatest discoveries have come when models were far away from acutely representing and they were used as tools. When representational aspects were very limited and, and the models were used to, as tools to think and discover new ideas, explore what if this was this way. So this is what uh, I will illustrate in this, in this other part of the talk. So Dennis Noble has this fantastic paper on successes and failures in modeling heart cell electrophysiology. And it, the paper starts with a sentence that I think is really important and it's very difficult for people to really um, understand, for all of us to understand deeply what it means. Uh, he says there is a widespread belief in the biomedical in biological sciences that to be useful a theory must be correct. And every, each, everybody who's done mathematical modeling at some, uh, at some point has heard somebody saying, oh, this model is completely wrong, or this model is rubbish. But failure, he says, is an essential part of a two-way iterative process between theory and experiment. And I think embracing this um, culture of failure of a model to represent is fine. It can discover new idea, it can discover new knowledge, it can discover new grounds that you wouldn't be able to identify without it. And this is the value, the value of a model as a tool. I put here the analogy of um, painting, actually. Um, and. Uh, I, 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 I put the analogy because I think um, early representations of human body were effective in actually representing what they wanted to represent, but it's only through many, many iterations and many years of history that we are able to represent the human body in, in, a, in more realistic terms. And it's only through that process of, uh, of iteration that we uh, um, develop models that are able to represent what we want and then even get away from these representations to actually explore grounds that are different to um, a pure representation of the human body. And I think in that sense, modeling and simulation have had a, a similar process. I'm obviously not a historian of art, but I can see the similarities between this. So let's embrace failure as an opportunity from uh, discovery. This is obviously um, uh, really, really clear. I think in the early stages of uh, computer modeling, uh, which uh, everybody knows that Dennis Noble started in the field of cardiac electrophysiology, and his early model was a very basic representation of the ion 
algorithmic processes that underlie cardiac behavior. Only two conductant tests, one for sodium, one for potassium, were able to um, provide this action potential. Um, through the iterative interaction between experiment and simulation, we, we gained understanding of, um, of, of the ionic mechanisms of electrophysiology, and we were able, through a communal effort that involved this iteration between models and, and experiments, to discover all these other ion channels that exist. And we were able to provide a more accurate representation of these ionic currents through that iteration. And I, I, that's all very well described in Dennis Noble's paper in Heart, in Heart Rhythm, the successes and failures of models. Now, this iteration between experiments and simulations has led to a huge variety of cardiac cellular models for different species, rabbit, dog, guinea pig, human. And a lot of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this has led to also more, um, papers comparing these models. Uh, I, what, I, what I find very, very interesting when we compare models in a deep way is that you can uh, draw conclusions about how these computer models use data and how the computer models can tell you things about the data that were used in, in these computer models. So a classic, a classic example is how um, data obtained from uh, isolated cells versus tissue are used in the constructions of these computer models. Conductances can be estimated straight from the measurements in voltage club experiments, or they can be estimated indirectly uh, in tissue experiments through the use of ph pharmacological agents. Depending on how the authors interpret these data, they construct models that in fact can be very different, but they are actually targeting different things in the experiments. So a variety of models were produced uh, through this iteration of uh, uh, experiments and, and uh, computer simulations, and both the successes and failures of models to represent led to discoveries. The, the highlight, I think, of this work, uh, in my opinion, has been the uh, O'Hara Woody model, uh, the model that Tom O'Hara and Yura Woody developed in collaboration with Andros Farrow and Laszlo Virag, who did the experimental um, work that was required to uh, construct some of the of the equations in the model. This model is is of obviously building on a lot of the work that was done before, and in particular the, the model, the human ventricular model by Tentusher and Pamphilov with Dennis Novel. But this model has is so well developed uh, thanks to all this knowledge that even the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is considering using it for regulatory purposes to evaluate the, the, the safety of medicines. And this initiative called CIPA um, is actually doing things, I think, in the right way, in that they are proposing to use in silico assays, so computer simulations, in combination with in vitro technologies, in order to assess the safety of medicines. And I think it's very important to pair in silico and in vitro technologies in order to assess the predictions of the models and assess whether they are succeeding or failing in, um, in uh, um, predicting what comes out of the experiment. So I think it's a, it's a huge development in, in our field to have a human model that is being considered for regulatory purposes. I, I also looked in, in evaluating this field, I also looked at the number of citations of these models. And you can see uh, of, of these papers um, describing uh, computer models. You can see here that the Lurudi model, which was a very basic representation, for example, of the guinea pig action potential, is having over a thousand citations. And other models have huge number of citations. The RRD model only in a few years has 245 citations. I don't focus on citations only, but I think this tells you um, the amount of work that actually has been um, done using these models. And the reason for this is, of course, new mathematical developments, but also tons of studies that have used these models for specific questions, to answer specific questions to, uh, for specific applications. And this is a huge contribution of the field of computer modeling. 
One such studies, uh, which I would like to highlight, is this work by Colleen Clancy and Joram Rudy that was published in Nature. And it's a study that I think was spot on in addressing one of the biggest challenges in biomedicine that I, that I outlined at the beginning of my talk, linking genotype to phenotype. It was spot on because they developed a model of an ion channel affected by a genetic defect, and they were, try they, they, they were able to recover the cellular phenotype. This is a, 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 a very, very important use of computer models. And in fact, mathematical modelers can find many flaws with this approach because parameters cannot be quantified, they are uncertain, they are not unique. You can find many, many flaws, but from the biomedical science point of view, this paper is incredibly important in showing the use of computer models in linking genotype to phenotype. In a similar way, this other paper shows uh, the use of a computer model to predict uh, cardiac risk in patients with a genetic mutation too. It, I think this paper is also very, very important because it combines a clinical database on 633 subjects with 34 mutations and a one-dimensional transmural electrocardiography computer model that is actually a very poor representation of these subjects. However, the, model, the, the, the authors use it as a tool to actually predict clinical outcomes and to improve risk stratification in patients with LQT1. So what this paper shows, it, it moves us away from the use of computer models in basic science, which I think is extremely important, to a translational use of models. And in this case, case models considered as tools to actually allow prediction of cardiac risk. This linking genotype to phenotype is featured in other areas of biomedical science. And in this paper, also in Nature, published in 2010, you can see how they link genotype to phenotype for teeth morphology. And I'm sure that this is, this is also a theme in very high impact papers in many areas of biomedical science, because it is a challenge to link genotype to phenotype in biomedical science. Another area I really wanted to uh, mention of the use of computer models to understand the critically important biomedical question is in understanding sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death is, is very often um, a result of ventricular fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia that just makes you drop dead in 10 minutes and can only be stopped with an electric shock. The, the, we now know that sudden cardiac death and ventricular fibrillation are due to spiral waves that develop in the heart. And these were predicted very early on in 1946, 1948, and later by uh, work uh, uh, by Moe and Krinsky, thanks to Sasha Pamphilov and Flavia Fenton, by the way, for providing these references. So the early theoretical studies were, were very instrumental in actually providing this hypothesis of ventricular fibrillation. It's only in the 90s when um, uh, Pertsov, Halife, Davidenko, Gray actually showed us similar type of behavior in, uh, in experimental studies and through an iteration between what the models are, are telling us and what we can measure we now understand much more of the dynamics of ventricular fibrillation. And this is a review paper um, by Kirsten Tentusha, Pamphilov, and Peter Taggart, with others that have had a very important contribution um, in understanding ventricular fibrillation through this combination of experiments and computer models. Uh, the, the treatment of ventricular fibrillation is electrical defibrillation. And we, you all know that this is um, the delivery of a high energy uh, electric shock to the heart. It's been used uh, both through external defibrillators, and this is very common now to see electrical defibrillators in public places, but also in internal defibrillators with people who are at risk of dying for, from ventricular fibrillation and they get an implanted defibrillator. The history of understanding electrical defibrillation started with a mathematical model. And in this viewpoint written by Natalia Trianova, um, 
you, you can see a history of how theoretical predictions preceded our understanding of defibrillation. This was done actually by physicists in uh, Brad Roth, Wixbow, and Sepulveda. And using a two dimensional passive bi domain model, they show that electrical stimulation can create very complicated patterns of polarization. So again, from the representational point of view, this model was very poor. It was a passive model, a two-dimensional model, but it really helped us discover something that was fundamentally important to understand defibrillation. It was only a few years later that the same people, actually John Wicks, who, uh, developed the experimental setup to prove the predictions of this model. And again, like for spiral waves, theoretical predictions preceded the experiments that uh, were possible uh, to actually I, um, uh, show this behavior. Um, this, this work led to, again, more iterations between experiments and simulations that allowed us to understand defibrillation better. This is one of my studies. I was very lucky when I went to Natalia Trajanova's lab in 2002 because Jamie Eason and Felipe Aguel had just developed this bi-domain model of the rabbit heart. It was the first bi-domain model of an anatomically accurate, using an anatomically accurate uh, anatomy. And we collaborated with Igor Efimov, who was doing the experiments. And in, in the combination between experiments and simulations, we were able to show what was the effect of having a certain anatomy in the heart that was uh, with a different thickness in the right and the left ventricle. What was the effect of this asymmetry in the anatomy in the delivery of uh, defibrillation? And, and I'm putting this paper because it shows the combination of experiments and simulations in the same paper. And it also shows the beginning of using uh, bi-domain models uh, with uh, cardiac, realistic cardiac anatomies. This use of image-based models has been developed enormously in the, in the last year. And you, you have here a review that shows images as drivers of progress in cardiac computational modeling. These two papers I'm highlighting here are quite important, I think, in translational work. They show how a model that is derived for, from imaging can be used to predict ventricular um, circuits. And what I also think is important in these papers is that whereas the models look like representations, they are used as tools. They are used as tools to try to predict these ventricular circuits. And of course, people who see them as representations can again find many flaws because the electrophysiology is not personalized. It's just purely based on structure. But if these models are successful, it's because they are showing that only by taking into account structural uh, features like SCAR, you still can are able to recover these ventricular circuits. So, uh, I think it's the interpretation of these models as tools that allow us to make the greatest discoveries. And in fact, um, these results, as, as the authors say, these results pave the way for the translation of in silico modeling of post myocardial infarction arrhythmogenesis into clinical utility. So just like in linking genotype to phenotype, we are seeing the first steps towards the clinical application of these models. And I think that's very, very important. So for me, computer models are tools with a representational element. The ideal situation is when you have a very, very fancy model uh, that, uh, that represents your data perfectly well, and you can nail, you can hammer the nail with that. And you, this is the ideal uh, situation. Very often, if this is not the case, very often you don't have the perfect hammer. You have a stone to actually put the nail in. But that's an okay situation because at the end, what you want is to discover. And of course, you need many iterations of, um, to actually produce the fantastic hammer. But a tool, uh, a computer model is a tool. And if you achieve the purpose, 
then that's a fantastic result. What is not okay is to actually use a hammer to um, wash a glass, for example. But in this case, you wouldn't blame the hammer. You wouldn't blame the model if you use it in an incorrect way. You blame the user. So we need to be quite smart in terms of how we use models in biomedical science because they are tools to actually discover new grounds. Just to finish, I, I would like to uh, talk about what I think the biggest challenge in biomedicine is, and certainly in cardiac research, and it's population heterogeneity due to environmental factors. The fact that we all change due to a variety of uh, external, um, uh, st external stimuli. In, in our cardiac models, for example, maximum ionic conductances are considered as parameters uh, following Hodgson and Huxley's work and Dennis Noble's work. But in fact, they are a product of unitar unitary channel conductance and numbers of channels. And this number of channels can fluctuate quite a lot. They are regulated by sugar, hormones, temperatures, circadian rhythms, drugs affecting other channels, so a variety of stimulus. Our hearts are constantly, constantly changing, not like when we age, which is in matters of years, but in, in hours, our, our circadian rhythms are changing our, our ionic currents. If we ch have changes in hormones, uh, testosterone has been shown to, to change the, one of the currents that is most important to repolarization by 35%. So this, these parameters that we think are parameters are changed by a multitude of uh, different stimuli. So perhaps the biggest lie in computer cardiac models is that maximum conductances are parameters. And in fact, they are variables and there is no way we can know what the functions are that underlie these variations. Uh, I'll put an example of how we dealt with it in a, in a recent paper with uh, Peter Thackett and Pierre Labias, who actually record electrical potentials in in patients, so they put a sock of electrodes around the heart of patients. And um, we, we could see a lot of variability in the electrograms that were recorded. So we wanted to understand the different phenotypes that were coming from these recordings. So what we did is uh, we used the Ohio Woody model, which, uh, as I said before, is a fantastic model with a lot of detail. And what we did is, uh, in, in, in order to take into account this heterogeneity and this variability, we varied the conductances rather than considering them as parameters. We varied them, um, we considered them as parameters, but they could vary in a very, very wide range. So the models in the population share the same equations, but they are, the parameters are varied in a wide range to consider a wide range of ionic scenarios. This is a methodology that we proposed in a recent paper also in PNAS. So in some sense, the model represent, because we kept only the models that were in range with the experiments. So we, we use the models at the cellular level as representations, but at the ionic level, we consider a very wide range of underlying scenarios. So we were using them as tools to explore a very, very different set of scenarios. And then we checked whether the models actually could represent the phenotypes in the in vivo data. And I won't go in detail, but what this is showing is that we had two main types of phenotypes and that were reproduced both in the in vivo data and in the simulations by considering this very very wide range of scenarios so our models could represent the data at the cellular level but what we wanted is to understand what the, the differences in phenotype were at the ionic level. And what the computer models gave us were likely ionic mechanisms underlying the differences in phenotype in the in vivo recordings. So because the biggest challenge is population heterogeneity due to environmental factors, maybe in computer modeling for some applications, we, change, we need to change the focus from modeling with specific parameter values, trying to achieve a perfect representation of what we have, to more creative approaches that allow exploring a range of scenarios and explaining phenotypes. So the change of focus goes from focusing on parameters to focusing on phenotypes and using models as 
tools. And I, I, I think this also makes sense uh, if you read these papers on universally slow parameter sensitivities in systems biology models. So just in conclusion, computer models are tools for exploration and discovery. Both their success and failure to represent is equally an opportunity for discovery, which is actually missed if you only consider models as representations. Cardiac research is full of discoveries through iterations, and I've put here some examples in cardiac research, um, which I think actually match the challenges in biomedical science, like linking genotype to phenotype or understanding structure and function interplay. The biggest challenge, in my opinion, is variability due to experimental challenges. And I think we need new creative approaches to exploit models as tools, as tools that allow us to imagine new possibilities and as tools that allow us to explore what if this may happen, something you cannot do experimentally. And I, I think I need to say also that the increased complexity in computer modeling calls for special, specialization and importantly interdisciplinary collaborations. And we, we need to aim at, at collaborations that help us accelerate the iteration between experiments and simulations and not stay in theoretical research, but look for accelerating impact of computer models in biomedicine. And with that, I just want to thank you all and um, answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Well, thank you, Blanca. Um, the, so we move on to the question and answer session. For the attendees, if you uh, have any question, you can either talk if you have uh, a microphone or if you prefer you can type in the question uh, so that i can read uh, we already have this, several questions we have two questions from carlos and uh, several questions from others and the first question from carlos is uh, that uh, he's been working with some electrical propagation over the uh, cardiac models sorry i yeah. have seen it yeah, and uh, he just found that literature lacks the uh, stability, convergence, and parameter sensitivity analysis. Yeah. Uh, he's asking, do you think this is the, an issue that should be addressed in the biomedical field? I, I mean, I, I think uh, sensitivity analysis, convergence, and, uh, and uh, stability are very important issues, but it depends on the question you want to address. So that, that, it, that perhaps wasn't clear in my, in my talk, but for me, every computer model needs to be linked, the use of a computer model link needs to be linked to a question. So I think you need, you need to formulate what the research question you are trying to answer is, and from there design a study that is solid numerically um, and scientifically. So, it depends on what you want to do. Of course, I think uh, those are important issues, but it's not the only thing we can do in biomedical research. And for the next question, he's asking, how do you think about the block back, uh, block, the black box uh, model? Yeah, I mean, the, the use of machine learning, I think uh, the combination of machine learning with computer modeling, I think is a very attractive um, area of research. The, the black box models, so, so what I think we we're using this in the in the work of, um, in particular, Aurore Lyon, and to we are using machine learning to classify and try to identify different subpopulations in uh, and different phenotypes. And I think once you have used machine learning to identify different phenotypes, computer models can be used to actually explain each of the phenotypes and, in particular, how structure. Uh, determine the different phenotypes. So an another, another use of machine learning is actually in classifying when you have these populations of action potential models, for example, if you, have, if you are exploring a very wide range of scenarios, you, you need tools to actually classify the different scenarios. And I think machine learning is, is one way of doing it. So I think it is a very trendy area, the combination of machine learning and computer modeling, and one that will give a lot of uh, discoveries in the future. Next question from uh, uh, Corey is, what are likely approaches to bring environmental factors into 
the modeling and the simulation uh, space? Well, I mean, good question. Um, wh what I have shown in the last study is one way we thought we could do it. Um, so rather than considering trying to capture specific parameter values and try to calculate uncertainty, to actually know that conductances are going to vary. So even if you can identify a value of a conductance in a particular point in time, this is going to be changing. And due to hormones, circadian rhythms, and a lot of factors we don't understand. So rather than going for specific values, go for many different scenarios and like use computer modeling in that way. I, I, I think that's one way we did it. Um, there are examples of papers that show the effect of hormones, for example, using computer modeling. But it's for us to actually discover that. Just, I think it's the biggest challenge, and I, I, I'm very keen to, to take that into account. And the way to do it, uh, people will come with very different creative approaches to actually do that. But we need to consider it. We need to consider the fact that our hearts are changing due to external factors and our cells and our conductances are not static. They change a lot. Uh, thank you very much. This is Korai from ABR from New Zealand. I was just thinking whether you see kind of the current uh, personal um, kind of health apps, uh, you know, collecting seamlessly uh, sensor data about the environment and kind of physiological yeah. conditions and this kind of crowdsourcing approach to to bring those kind of opportunities for bringing in the environmental and kind of rich wellness type of data into the picture. I don't have answers. I have more questions than answers in that case. But I do think that these um, uh, portable devices are going to give us a lot of data on environmental factors. And machine learning, for example, is going to help analyzing those data, I hope, in the future. And, and when we understand more about it, we will be able to use also computer modeling uh, to try to assess those, the, the, the effect of these environmental factors. I mean, we can already do it if we, if we, if we get away from the, from the mathematical-minded people that want initial conditions and parameters to be identified certainly. Biology is not about that. And, and I think the, what you are mentioning um, are approaches to biomedical sciences that are going to help us understand more about the environmental factors and we will be able to use modeling in that space too. Um, I, I mean, in, in reviewing funding applications, I already start seeing this type of uh, research being proposed and I think it's really exciting. Yeah, I mean I, I got a PhD student specifically looking at this, uh, bringing this environmental um, impacts into the yeah. picture. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'll probably contact you for further uh, details offline. What, I, what I'm trying to say in all of this is that the, the challenge is so big that we will have to have different approaches and be inclusive in the type of approaches we have. But yeah, I mean, happy to discuss. Yeah, thank you. And we have another question from uh, Vittorio. Uh, yeah. He's asking. Oh, yeah, I can I, see that. Yeah, okay. Is it feasible to infer clinically relevant genotype from clinical data like ECG or serum? electrolytes. I'm thinking about personalized medicine. So is it feasible? You tell me. So it depends on what, what it is that you are looking at. Clinically, you can tell some things about the genotype of people. You can know whether they have mutations on ion channels, affecting ion channels, for example. Um, I mean, it's a tough question because for me, it depends on the specific scenario. And in fact, it, it, the feasibility also depends on the, on the clinical collaborator that you have and what they are able to do. So it's not only theoretically whether it's feasible, it's in practice whether the actual clinician is going to be gathering those data and making them available to you. So in some cases, it is feasible. And some of the research I showed shows that you can link genotype to ECG, but of course it depends on 
what, what it is that you infer from it. So I think there is a place for computer modeling in personalized medicine, but it's not immediate. And it, it will take as many years of iterations to actually make contributions, just like in any other area, like painting, for example. Okay, thank you. I think I have a question here. For modeling, it's very important, a cardiac modeling. We see a large variations among the models. For yeah. atrial models, specifically, for example, and uh, sometimes we can get uh, results yeah. from uh, these models, and the results can be model dependent. Yeah. So what, what do you think? Uh, how are we going to interpret in this uh, simulating data that is, uh, can be sometimes model dependent? So you need, you need to interpret the results of the simulations based on how the models were constructed and what the models yeah. include. So sometimes models are different because they represent different things. So one of, one of, the, one of the, the issues with computer models, for example, of atrial cells is that whereas the data and the, the population of uh, the human popula population is very heterogeneous, these models have been developed to represent one action potential. Mm. That is generic. So I think that's one of the big problems uh, in, in computer modeling of, of cardiac cells. They have integrated data that are quite heterogeneous to represent a single action potential. So mm. of course they're going to give you different answers if the models, if they have different calcium dynamics or they, if they have been um, if they have been developed in different ways. So I think it is really, really important to know these models very well and mm. to use the right model for the right application. And for that, you need to know the models very well. We are getting away from using single action potential models and we are using populations of action potential models because the assumption of having one specific parameter value for us is worse than actually having a lot of different combination possible. Hmm. Uh, and in some sense, you get away from the problem of having these this unique parameter values by using populations of models. But I mean, in some sense, it is important to know that whether the results are model specific or not, and also use, uh, so in some cases, for example, in our research, we use several models and for atrial models, there are several models that can be very useful. For human ventricular uh, dynamics, I think the O'Hara Woody is, is better for, is more suitable for repolarization, for example, than the Tentusha model. But the Tentusha model is still, uh, is still more suitable for um, studies of restitution and fibrillation. So, and even mm -hmm. ischemia. So it depends on what it is that you want to study. And you just need to know your models really well. Okay, I see. Thank you. And uh, if uh, we don't, if we don't have any other questions from the general audience, we like to thank you again, Blanca. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks. Thanks a lot.